So good evening, everyone. Um, is my sound OK? OK. Um, Shelly has some other commitments for the next two weeks. So I'm going to be doing our sessions. And she may drop in if she is available. Our format is we're going to meditate for about 30 minutes, and then I'm going to make some remarks, and we're going to have a discussion. So is there anyone else here who is new tonight? Anyone want to um, put anything in the chat about how you are? Or should we do a weather report after the meditation? You can say it was foggy, it was cloudy. Um, so um, before we start, I just want to acknowledge that um, I'm here in Minneapolis, uh, physically very close to common ground. And so um, I am speaking to you from um, land that is Dakota land. Um, and it's land that is close to the Bedote, which is the sacred uh, confluence of the Mississippi and the, what we call the Mississippi and the Minnesota rivers. And that for the Dakota was the um, place of creation. It's where the first people were. And um, Dakota women, if they could, would try to be there right at the confluence when they were about to have a child. So their child would see the same sunrise as the first peoples. And so, you know, this is really extremely sacred land that we are close to. And the Dakota are um, very much a living people, very much um, integral to uh, the life of this state, this community. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge that. So we're going to sit for about 30 minutes. And if you would um, have yourself in a posture that is really kind to yourself, that allows you to be um, alert, but not, not stiff in any way. And I would also really ask you to invite your whole self here this evening. All those parts of you, um, the judgmental parts, the um, all of the parts that um, you may think are not your meditator parts, um, they are all welcome here tonight. So I'm just going to ring the bell once to start and once at the end. So please feel your whole selves completely welcomed right here and right now. This mind, this body, however it is, it's completely welcome. And just take some time to inhabit the body, to feel its solidity, to feel it in space, to feel it grounded. And you might take a few deeper breaths than usual. And just let the exhales be very 
long and soft. And our mindfulness practice is just remembering to be aware of the present moment's experience as best we can without elaboration. And so often our practice is a kind of doing practice or it's very easy <coughs> for us to find ourselves striving. So experiment, if you can, with letting this evening's mindfulness practice be one of receptive awareness, more of a being, than a doing. I'm just settling into this body, this mind. And it's as if you are watching the clouds in the sky. Whatever arises, passes away. Just letting your awareness be present with it. And if possible, see if this awareness can just be infused with a kind of kindliness. A kind of kindly acceptance of however things are with this mind and this body right now.
And as we bring this meditation to a close, see if you can just bring about some felt sense of appreciation or gratitude. It can be as simple as just gratitude that you were able to be here this evening, that you were able to follow through with your intention. Gratitude is sometimes said to be the single most effective intervention for a sense of well being. So it's often a nice way to end a period of meditation with some gratitude or some metta. So happy to see everyone here this evening. If you'd like, you can stretch a little bit, move around, get a swallow of something to drink. You could put a, a word in the chat if you'd like about how that meditation was for you, how you're feeling tonight. Wonderful, settled, content. Well, thanks for Ah, thank you, thank you um, for the, um, I actually got a direct message from Brian and I'd like to just um, acknowledge it. Brian said that tonight I, when I said I was um, gonna be here instead of Stacy and Stacy might be stopping by, um, Brian kindly reminded me that Stacy goes by they, them and not she. So. I really appreciate that reminder and that correction. So thank you. Really, really appreciate it. And I go by she, her, so. So it's often said that um, our Dharma practice is like a bird that uh, flies on two wings. And one of the wings is wisdom and the other is compassion. And both of those wings have to be strong. So this week, I'm going to talk about wisdom and hope that we can uh, discuss it. And next week, I'll talk about compassion <clears throat> as the other, other wing. And I want to begin with a story from my own experience. Um, it was in the late 80s, um, before I'd started uh, a practice. And at that time, I was the director of a small arts organization. And um, the organization had a board, like many boards, you know, had an attorney, had some uh, artists, some writers, um, some folks from other organizations, and it had um, a few um, philanthropists, a few donors. And um, one of the uh, philanthropist was a very wealthy 
but completely unassuming person. Person very um, modest in her manner, in her dress, very, very um, um, humble. And um, she was willing to serve on unglamorous committees and she always showed up for meetings, unlike some folks who you know, serve routinely uh, cancel at the last minute. And one day when I think she was the only person to uh, show up on time, I uh, said to her how much I appreciated that I could always count on her to attend meetings. And she said really clearly, I can, I can visualize it still. She said, Patrice, I live by four rules. Show up, pay attention, tell the truth, and don't be invested in the outcome. And this really seemed to me to be the way she, um, she lived her life. Um, I was struck by it then, and it um, has continued to be a really useful guide. Um, one way that I used it at the time was that I was involved with a lot of organizations doing a lot of things. And um, I realized that if I was sort of making excuses to show that I didn't want to show up for something that I was involved in, I really needed to rethink my commitment to it. If I showed up for something, but I wasn't really paying attention, I was you know, sort of making notes for something else, doing something else, I really needed to, uh, again, really investigate why I was involved with that. And if it wasn't a place where I thought I could really tell the truth, and I, I was out of there. And the last one about don't be invested in the outcome, that one for me still seems sort of theoretical and, um, and aspirational. Um, but uh, that was the one that in the years of my, my Dharma practice, um, I really began to understand that not being invested in, in the outcome as the wisdom of non-clinging. So my encounter with this, this wise person that really continues to have a, I, I didn't know her for actually after she was um, off the board, didn't know her, never followed through, like wasn't a, a close friend in, in any way, but someone whose demeanor and whose clarity about the way she lived her life um, from someone who really had considerable wealth and, and status. It just, this encounter with this wise person really had uh, a profound effect on me. And in, in the Pali Canon, which is you now the recorded teachings of the Buddha, wisdom appears on several lists. Um, in one regard, it's the culmination of the five um, spiritual powers, which are faith, or confidence, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and then wisdom. And Joseph Goldstein notes that wisdom is the force of mind that illuminates how things really are so that we can see clearly. So this is sort of wisdom as, as a spiritual power. It's the force of mind that illuminates how things really are so that we can see clearly. And this illuminating wisdom develops gradually as our mindfulness practice reveals um, over and over the arising and passing away of all thoughts, sensations, emotions. We begin to understand the conditioned nature, the conditional nature of all experience. Everything comes into being due to a variety of causes and conditions. So wisdom is understanding the imperfect, impermanent, impersonal nature of experience. Wisdom is what is caused, wisdom is recognizing this sort of causal nature of experience. And since all things are 
impermanent, uh, imperfect, impersonal, we can come to understand the wisdom of non-clinging because everything is always, always changing. And non-clinging doesn't mean that we shouldn't appreciate, savor, love, grieve. We do all those things and we do them wholeheartedly while deeply understanding their transitory nature. Clinging is what happens when we adhere to something, when we um, refuse to acknowledge the transitory nature of something. Clinging occurs when we are uh, in effect contesting reality and wisdom is this deep insight into reality, but it's an insight that can't be forced. It's gradual and develops over time in our practice. But there's another um, application of wisdom and it's wisdom in our, our daily life. And the Buddha said that the wise person is one who chooses the more lasting happiness over the one that is more immediate, even if both of these choices are not harmful. So it's that one wisdom is looking at one's long time benefit. It's looking at the big picture rather than choosing, you think, choosing what is immediate, even if what is immediate is, is harmless, a harmless gratification. Wisdom is that ability to, uh, to choose the, the more lasting, um, the more lasting benefit. And this is, you know, what we often talk about as um, deferred gratification. And the philosopher, if I'm remembering this correctly, the philosopher Hannah Arendt once said, the whole purpose of education is to teach deferred gratification, that becoming an adult is the whole process of learning to defer gratification. And wisdom is choosing what is truly beneficial and avoiding or abandoning what is harmful. So wisdom is, is choosing what is truly beneficial for us and avoiding uh, what is harmful, abandoning what's harmful. <clears throat> so um, Aristotle, uh, again, someone who was uh, often very wise, not, not completely, he was tragically wrong about women, but but Aristotle had something really interesting to say about ethics. Aristotle said, you could never, you can't persuade someone that they should be ethical, that they should be, be moral. You can't persuade someone, but a person who experiences what it is to live a life of integrity a person who lives a life that is um, an inherently ethical life realizes how superior that is to a life that, that is not guided by ethics. And Aristotle actually thought that that was kind of a perfection of being a human being, is that you had this capacity to be ethical and that you could choose to act in, uh, in ethical ways. And I think although this isn't, um, doesn't map exactly onto um, what the Buddha is talking about, there is this, this sense that we can choose what is, um, what is in our long-term benefit and that we can appreciate um, what it is to live a life of, of integrity. And the place where this 
maps on is that we know that through experience. Having had the experience of living a life of integrity, or you can even think about um, something like the practice of, of generosity that, you know, why should you, uh, why should a person be, be generous? And often when we practice generosity, we just notice how really good it feels. Um, I remember hearing years ago, and I think it was Walker Percy talking about Eudora Welty, but I'm not sure about that. But he, he had asked, this one writer had asked another um, older woman writer, um, you know, what she'd learned from her life. You know, she had any words of wisdom. And she said, she said, I have never uh, regretted a single act of generosity. I have only regretted my false economies. And I just love that. I mean, that, that just instinctively seemed to make so much sense. I have never uh, regretted an act of generosity. I have only regretted my false economies. And again, you can just think about how that, that might ring true for your own experience. How, how inherently wise that seems when we hear something like that. But it's also something that we can experiment with. You know, we can experiment with what it's like when we practice generosity. And we can experiment with what it's like when we decide not to give. And just see, see that, to mix a metaphor, see the taste of it in a way. Just really pay attention to what happens when, we, um, when we're not being generous. So there's a real, um, a real arena to explore. So the Buddha um, was teaching his son Rahula about ethics and there's this famous sutta and Rahula is maybe eight or nine or ten. He's a fairly um, young novice in the monastery and the Buddha says to him, before you act Rahula, consider, will this act be harmful to myself? Will it be harmful to another? Will it be harmful to both of us? He said, and when you're actually doing the act, consider, is this harmful to me? Is this harmful to another? Is it harmful to both of us? And then after the act, reflect, was this act harmful to me? Was this act harmful to another? Or was this, um, was this act harmful to both of us? And the Buddha said, even if the first two, you know, you considered it, you thought wasn't going to be harmful, you were doing it, you didn't think it was going to be harmful while you were doing it. But after it was done, there were harmful consequences. What you need to do then is to seek the counsel of a wise person. That you know, your intentions may have been good before, it may have been good while you were doing it, but if they result in harm, you need to seek the counsel of a wise person. Again, very, very practical, really good advice. When things don't turn out the way we intended, we seek the counsel of a person who has um, more experience or, um, or a different perspective. And, this has been true in uh, many of our 
white dominated meditation communities, um, we've come to understand, particularly in this last decade, how our good intentions, our intentions of being colorblind, of not seeing racialized identity, our own or others, has harmed both white and BIPOC practitioners. It was not intentional, but we've come to see that it, it, these um, not seeing color, of trying to practice a kind of color blindness in the Sangha was actually a really harmful practice. And those harms have been um, explained and, and addressed by really wise Dharma teachers of color in Dharma talks and in print and in classes and in healing circles. Um, and this wisdom is, is available and there is a lot of wisdom out there. It's available here at Common Ground in the Tuesday night um, Buddhist justice vigil, which I would really encourage people to, um, to attend. Um, it's uh, in Larry Yang's wonderful book, Awakening Together, the spiritual practice of inclusivity and community. And in Black and Buddhist, what Buddhism can teach us about race, resilience, transformation, and freedom, which is edited by Ayo Yutundi, who teaches here at Common Ground. And, uh, um, and also uh, Cheryl Giles is the other um, editor of that, that book. So in our, uh, in our practice of the Dharma, it's really crucial not only to have these wise teachers, but to have friends who take seriously the effort to live uh, a very moral life. And many of you have heard the passage uh, where Ananda, who was the Buddha's attendant, says, uh, Venerable Lord, it occurs to me that half the holy life is having spiritual friends. And the Buddha says, oh no, Ananda, no, don't say that, Ananda. The whole of the holy life is having spiritual friends. So Larry, Larry Yang says, we are never practicing alone and we can have a profound influence on others around us. We are never practicing alone even when we think we are. And we can have a profound influence on those around us. So in my pre-Buddhist days, as I mentioned, I was profoundly influenced by the example and the words of someone who despite wealth and status um, was an example of unpretentiousness and integrity. And I've had the good fortune in, uh, in my practice to meet wise teachers who have taught not only in words, but also by example. And I've had wonderful uh, Dharma friends who have really um, I say supported me, but Dharma friends with whom there is a kind of, of honesty and um, an integrity where we really um, really help each other in living a more, a life with, with greater truth to it. And ultimately I think um, becoming wiser and better in, um, in both our form, formal practice, but also in, uh, in trying to work for um, a better, uh, more just, more equitable uh, world. And this has really been through um, Dharma practice and working with other Dharma practitioners that I felt so um, inspired to be really engaged in ways that I could not have anticipated 
years ago. And it really comes out of, I think, a deep, a deep Dharma friendship. So what I thought we could do in our discussion tonight is I'd like you to um, reflect and, um, and share the sort of wisdom that's been important in your own life. And I'd like you to think back to times in your, um, in your growing up, maybe when you had um, uh, an aunt, a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, or someone who, um, who taught you something, who told you something that really was um, for you one of the kind of foundations in your own sense of how to be a wise person, what a wise person would do. So I would be really, we all have stories and some might be more recent, but stories of people who have taught us something about what it means to be a wise person in some way. So who is going to be the, the generous person to uh, start off our, our discussion? Your joy in remembering him is so palpable. And that's, that's something um, else just to, um, when there are good people in our lives, wise people in our, our lives, you know, remembering them um, brings us such joy. And uh, I hope this is also, if um, anyone here is, is a teacher, because there are a lot of teachers in the Sangha, you know, to, to just take heart that you never know, you know you're planting a seed and you, you may never know the sort of, of um, influence you have on uh, someone else just by being who you are, being a person of, uh, of great integrity. So um, yeah, yeah. We feel so good when we're around um, wise people. You know, like if you listen to, um, uh, the Dalai Lama, he's an, an example of um, a really wise, uh, wise person and a person with a great sense of humor. And, you know, he, um, my experience is that people just feel kind of uplifted, feel better for being um, around him or the, the wonderful um, uh, philosopher, Buddhist scholar, and um, environmentalist, Joanna Macy. She is another really wise, um, wise soul. Uh, and uh, I'm just so uh, happy to be around. Um, or Ruth King, who the, the author of Mindful of Race, is another person that you can't be in Ruth's presence for 10 minutes without smiling and feeling good. And, um, and I think it's also because really um, some, I, I shouldn't say it's uniformly, but some of the people who seem to me to be really wise, really see other people and pay attention to them, that their, their presence, that idea about really, really being there and really being comfortable with themselves. Um, I think that that's probably, you know, like the Dalai Lama, he seems so completely comfortable in, in his own skin and, and so unselfconscious um, that um, people just um, respond, respond to that. Um, so you know, when we, we think about the people in our lives who are, are wise, they might not all be that way, but some of them will be that way. And so we can really think about that sort of um, embodied um, wisdom. Other, and some of the people that you think might be wise might not be people you know might be poets or writers or, or artists who inspired you? Anyone want to um, 
talk about where they've gotten some wisdom inspiration from other sources. Many teachers have quoted this, and I don't know who the first was, but something like um, spiritual maturity is um, having given up all hope of a better past. So when we can, can sort of not uh, spend a lot of time wishing that things had been different, if only, if only my parents had done this, if only I had no, if only, if only, if only, if only I'd been recognized, if only people had been nicer to me in high school, right? You can just go on and on, but, um, you know, if only my boss would, um, would appreciate me and that that's sort of, um, you know, uh, giving up all hope of, of a better past. So you just, you're grounded in, in the present with what was your, uh, what actually has happened. Um, uh, sort of cause and effect, what we talked about a little bit earlier too. So thanks for that, Carrie. It really is um, often really wise uh, and also compassionate to um, you know spend time in nature. That that is you know one of the most healing and connected sorts of things that uh, that we can do and often you know puts us in in perspective I mean when you're uh, standing among trees living living beings that are centuries old it really gives you a, a sort of sense of, of perspective sometimes to be among these these great beings that are are centuries old and so, um, you know, wisdom, uh, it, there's a sort of wisdom in, uh, in how we associate, not only the idea that the Buddha had about, you know, spiritual friends are the whole of, of the holy life, um, but we can think of, of um, friends too, in terms of, of befriending the natural world and being befriended by it and feeling that we, we belong in this natural world. And that's a, a really important part of um, wisdom in, in a lot of Joanna Macy's work, um, which is, um, she calls it sort of the great, the great turning where we, um, where we trust, uh, we trust that we will be able to act appropriately and, uh, and bring about a world that is, uh, is sustainable. You know, it's, um, she has this wonderful uh, line in a poem where she said, if we, if we trust ourselves and, uh, and our fellow species, um, that when it's when we are called to do something, we will have the courage and the wisdom to respond appropriately. And that's kind of a paraphrase of that, that poem. But it's the wisdom of, of connection, the wisdom of belonging. And that's a really important um, aspect that we discover. We discover that through our own experience, that wisdom of belonging, that not separate. And that's a, um, you know, a, a, a great and, and important um, aspect of, of our practice, which sometimes seems really solitary and you, know, you go to the cushion, you practice in silence, but actually our, uh, our practice really teaches us about non-separation. And that is, um, is a great teaching and brings about a, uh, is, is truly wise to see ourselves as not separate from. And that's something we can, um, we can learn, not separate from. 
I think probably a, a lot of us have read um, the poetry of Mary Oliver, which is a great teaching and in, in not separate from nature. The Buddha said that um, he came here to um, teach suffering and the end of suffering. And it's really through suffering often that we, um, we really deepen and really understand it. Um, suffering and adversity uh, can open the heart to suffering and adversity in others. What we're gonna be talking about next week about compassion, how we really develop compassion. And sometimes it's through uh, terrible suffering that we, uh, we come really to uh, have a great appreciation and open-heartedness um, for the suffering of others and a wish to alleviate it. So uh, that's, that's certainly true. Any, anything else before we share the merit? Uh, Larry Yang's Awakening Together and uh, the subtitle is The Spiritual Practice of Inclusivity and Community. And that came out about two years ago and um, Black and Buddhist just came out um, this year. And the subtitle of Black and Buddhist is what Buddhism can teach us about race, resilience, transformation and freedom. And um, that one is edited by Ayo Yutundi and Cheryl Giles. And I think there are eight authors in it. Lama Rod Owens is in it. Um, a number of um, Buddhist, uh, Black Buddhist practitioners from a variety of traditions. So it is a, a really wonderful, wonderful read. And they're widely, um, those books are pretty widely available. Anything else? Thank you for asking, Andrew. Okay, why don't we share the merit? <clears throat> Let's participate in this wonderful act of imaginative generosity. If there's any goodness to our practice, any merit, any benefit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, those persons we like, those persons we don't like, those persons we know, and the millions and millions of people that we don't know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would share all these blessings with the four-leggeds, the many-legged, the winged, the scaly, the slithery, for all beings everywhere. May all beings find a path of peace. May all beings be free from suffering. So good night, everybody, and thank you for um, being here.